Hello. So, my name is Jeff Joseph, and uh, for 20 years, from 1989 till 2009, I ran Cebu Cat Productions down in Palmdale. Uh, we started out as a film broker. I was buying and selling film prints to collectors and archives, and we kind of morphed into a stock footage house. Uh, we had 50,000 trailers, that was our specialty, coming attraction trailers. And then we wound up having the largest stereoscopic 3D collection in the world also. I purchased from uh, Bob Fermanac, who had started the 3D archive years earlier. I purchased his collection and then we added to it over the years. And so we were able to do uh, 3D expos at uh, the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood in 2003, 2006, and then last September we did the last one, which definitely will be the last one because film is pretty much dying and it's getting harder and harder to run uh, 35 millimeter dual interlock pretty much anywhere. Uh, when I approached the American Cinematheque and the Academy and UCLA about doing a 3D Expo back in 1953, uh, back in 2003 rather, 50th anniversary from 1953, uh, they had two major objections to doing it. One was uh, it would cost too much and we would never recoup our costs, which turned out to be really true. And the other problem was there weren't any prints, uh, other than like House of Wax and a couple of others, the studios didn't really have much. But between the material I bought from Bob Fermanac and then the material that uh, Grover Crisp at Sony was incredibly generous, he printed up the nine Sony features for us, uh, Columbia features and the shorts. We were able to do the expo in 2003. And then in the gap between the two, we managed to find a bunch of other stuff. And I'm gonna talk to you about uh, some of those. Okay. There we go. Uh, those are the 50 movies from the Golden Age, starting in Buona Devil and ending with Revenge of the Creature. Uh, 3D didn't really last too long in the 50s, a little bit over a year. Uh, by the time September of 1953 rolled around, uh, Cinemascope hit. The robe opened at Grauman's Chinese in September of that year and kind of was the final nail in the coffin to 3D. It was much easier for theaters to run Cinemascope than it was to run dual interlock 3D. And there were still some things in the pipeline at that point, so there were some releases in 54 and 55, but it, it was pretty much over within about a year. <coughs> we ran, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we ran 43 of these movies between the three expos. Just because we ran them doesn't mean they're necessarily preserved. I mean, there are certain titles, the, the studio titles tend to be, the House of Waxes, for example, but I, the Jury, for example, only exists as the print that we ran. And that's it. There's no negative, there's no nothing. Um, we did not run these seven movies, and this is basically the reason why. Uh, as you can see, Bounty Hunter and The Command, uh, we're not even sure were finished in 3D. They were shot that way, but by the time they were finishing them, 3D had pretty much died. Warners would have to probably spend some money to make them releasable. Uh, the RKO titles are in terrible condition. Louisiana Territory, may not even exist at all. At the last expo in 2000, uh, or uh, rather last, year, last September, we ran 12 minutes of footage of Louisiana territory that we found in 3D, and that may be all that exists on the movie at all. Uh, of the movies we didn't run, the only one that we could have run was The Moonlighter. Uh, it is a perfectly well-preserved film, but Warners wouldn't make a print for us, unfortunately. Uh, Son of Sinbad uh, never got a 3D release. Uh, Southwest Passage did get a 3D release, but as you can see, only one and a half negatives exist. The other half of one eye has vanished. Uh, we found half of it in an Italian lab, but uh, the rest seems to be gone. And Top Banana is pretty much a lost film, totally. Um, there's just nothing left on it except one, uh, two prints of one eye. Uh, we found paperwork from 1956 that the company that made it went bankrupt and had a bankruptcy auction. So my thought is that whoever bought the material at the bankruptcy auction wound up with it, but there's really no way to track it back, unfortunately. I wanted to talk to you mostly, though, oh, also I should mention that of the shorts, uh, there's only one that hasn't uh, surfaced yet, and that's Bandit Island. We've, we've found all the other shorts. Uh, there are 10 uh, foreign or rather non-English language features, none of which we ran, one of which has been preserved, an Italian one, but they wouldn't let us run it, unfortunately. They didn't have a DCP of it. Uh, but I mostly wanted to talk to you about some of the pre-Golden Age material that we found. Uh, as mentioned, there's been 3D since 1915. None of that has managed to survive. However, we have managed to survive, uh, what has managed to survive is some material from the 20s uh, and the 30s. 
The earliest material, and we're going to run some of this, so I'm, that's why I'm talking to you about it. The earliest surviving 3D is something called Plasticon. Uh, let me find it in my notes here real quickly. It's called Kelly's Plasticon Pictures. It was shot in Prismacolor by William Van Doren Kelly, one of the 3D pioneers. He was also a pioneer in color photography. What this piece is, it's kind of a demo film, really. It had a, uh, there was late 1922, it was released as something called Washington Through the Trees. And this clip you're going to see has about four or five minutes of that, and then four or five minutes of other footage, which we believe was a second short called Movies of the Future. But since that movie doesn't exist, we can't be sure of that. We think this reel was put together for uh, demonstration purposes to sell the process. Uh, another thing that we're running is, well, we're, we're labeling it Crespinel footage because that's what George Eastman House calls it. And again, it's a reel of nitrate that they were given uh, by the family of William Crespinel. It was shot by Jacob Leventhal and Frederick Ives. And again, we think these are scenes that were kind of cut together as a demo reel. Uh, Pathé released several shorts in the 1920s. We think, these, we think this footage is from those shorts, but we can't be sure because the shorts don't exist. Um, I wanted to tell you a story about one of the shorts that we found called A Day in the Country. Uh, this is one of the Robert L. Lippert shorts. There was three, uh, Bandit Island and College Capers were the other two. All three had vanished. Uh, when the Lippert Library was sold in the 1950s, the person who bought the library deliberately didn't take the shorts. In fact, they said they just didn't want them, so they were all thrown away. All the negatives, all the fine grains, all of it was trashed. So, if these shorts surface, it's going to have to be in release prints. Well, back when I was dealing film, I would get cold calls from people trying to sell me stuff. And I got a call from this fellow named Fred back east. This was about, oh, I think 10, 12 years ago. And he read me a list of film, and it was pretty boring. And then he says, a day in the country. And I said, hold it, a day in the country? He said, yeah, I think it's in 3D, anaglyph. It's a real faded print. I said, yeah, I might be interested in that. Um, how much do you want? Well, he wanted $300 for it, which was an awful lot of money for a faded Eastman color short. But still, if it's the only one in existence, I didn't blink an eye. I PayPal him the $300. And he vanished. In all the years I was dealing film, that rarely happened. But uh, I, I rarely got screwed on a deal. But he just vanished. His phone was disconnected. I didn't get the reel. Needless to say, I was unhappy. Uh, a friend of mine is a private eye, and I asked him to help me find Fred. And over the next several years, we tracked him. He had serious financial issues, it turned out. We found tax liens and all sorts of stuff going on. Finally, in 2006, just before we started working on Expo 2, uh, let's, I thought, let's give it one more try. And this time, I actually got Fred on the phone. Uh, he apologized and said he didn't have the money to send me. I said, I don't really want the money. I want the film. He said, well, I've got some bad news about that. Um, you know, the, the, uh, I had a pickup truck, and the little place behind the front seat. I had it stuffed back there, and my truck was towed because I didn't pay the payments on it, and I don't know what happened to it. So I said, do you know where the, it was towed to? He gave me the name of the towing company. I tracked it to there. I called them. This woman answered the phone. I explained what had happened. She put the phone down. I hear this paperwork. I hear a door slam. A few minutes later, she comes back, and she says, there's this can here, and it's got some film in it. It says, a day in the country. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, she charged me another $300 for storage fees, <laughs> which I paid. Uh, I gave her my FedEx number. She FedExed it. I was expecting it the next day. And wouldn't you know it, there was a big storm back east, and FedEx was late. I didn't get my FedEx package that day either. So one more day it came, and by goodness, there it was, a day in the country. Uh, beautiful condition print, although it was completely faded. He was right about that. He also had said something rather strange to me. He said that it can't be from 1953. It's got to be from the late 30s, early 40s, because he had run it years ago. And he said, that's what it looked like. I said, no, no, no. We know about this. It's from 1953. We have the advertisements and so on. He said, well, whatever. I got the reel. We took it down to a lab in Burbank. And the late Dan Sims and I uh, transferred it in various different ways. We kind of hot-rodded the equipment to try and extract the left eye and right eye out of this really faded anaglyph print. Then Dan took those two files and he massaged them even further and we outputted them back to a left eye and right eye stereo pair. And by God, it worked. Uh, there's a little bit of shadowing and ghosting on one eye, but it's not bad at all. I think uh, you'll be very pleased with it. 
Uh, it was the only way to save it, after all. I, I suspect with m technology today, we probably could do a little bit better job now, but we did this in uh, 2006, and I think it came out pretty good. Uh, another thing we, sh we found, uh, I think I talked to you about the, uh, the Crespinel reel. Uh, the Plasticon is uh, also extracted off a nitrate print, by the way. Plasticon was a 10-minute nitrate reel that, again, we took to the lab and we extracted the left eye and right eye of. Uh, the last thing I want to show you on the reel is something that we call the Norling footage. And what it was was uh, John Norling shot some test footage uh, in the 1930s and it wound up being sold to MGM to make audioscopics and new audioscopics, which again were only run anaglyphically, never as a left eye right eye pair. But how I got that, these uh, little clips, was a little bit interesting. In 1982, uh, a documentary was being made on the history of 3D called the 3D Movie. It was going to be directed by Leonard Schrader, the brother of Paul Schrader, and produced by uh, Lee Parker and Dean Burko. Uh, they had Japanese funding. Uh, don't forget, the early 80s was one of the high points of 3D, of over-under stereo vision 3D. Uh, they spent a million and a half dollars doing this documentary, acquiring all these wonderful elements and rare materials. They even had a print struck, and uh, for whatever reason, the financing fell through at the last minute, and the movie did not get finished. Uh, it was kind of a sore point with Leonard Schrader. I spoke to him about this years later, and he was pretty upset about it, even, as I say, 20 years later after the fact. The story had been that that one print that was struck was under his bed, but he would not confirm that. Uh, but we did still, uh, what happened was a storage facility I worked with uh, had a deal with me to call me whenever someone didn't pay their storage bill on film. And he called me and said there was 300 boxes of things that were labeled 3D movie. Do I want them? Yeah. I do. And I went down there and I picked the stuff up and that's where this Norling footage came from. Where they got it from, I do not know. Uh, but we found all sorts of interesting stuff there, including some over-under converted footage from Son of Sinbad, which indicates that in the early 80s, somebody had a left eye and right eye negative of Son of Sinbad, which has since vanished. So that few minutes of footage that we had from that may be that all that will ever surface in 3D of Son of Sinbad. Anyway, I want to run this reel for you, and then uh, I'm going to take some questions. Uh, make sure you have your glasses, please, and uh, let's go from there. Let's give it a go. Thanks. Lights, please. Yes, dim the lights, please.
A smith a mighty man is he, but just between us folks, he's muscle bound above the years. and jammer kids just out for an innocent walk in the country. Say, I might learn to like this country life. Now stop! Another one. All right, all right. So you got six more veils. Well, we're running out of film. kids get out of here now now stop that now give the girls a chance we want the girls
What is this? Magic at a time like this? The guys will never learn. Exactly. Oops. Made a funny. Made a funny. This is no one seeing eye to eye. I'll bet he doesn't eat scrambled eggs for a long time. What's so rare as a day in June? Blue skies, trees, apples, inspiration, and what a panorama. That reminds me, what happened to those dancing girls? Ah, oh, the Rover Boys. Inspiration moves them, maestro. Hey, look out for that brush! Just a few more depth strokes of the brush, and another masterpiece will be ready for the ash can. Eh, never touch me. A little clean fun and a quick getaway. They can't do that to you, Rimbant. Honest, Mama. We were just walking along and minding our own business when this fink runs up behind us with a big brush. They're here again. That's right, honey. Keep kissable. Uh, confidentially, uh, do you use that green stuff? Everything is all set here, and they go right into the arms of Pickle Puss. Get away from us, you pest! Ah, you miss me. You've been waiting for this. That was the farmer's daughter. Ah, they're gonna make dairy, huh? Well, folks, this is gonna be a tight squeeze. It's efficiency, that's what it is. Direct from the manufacturers to you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the motor car of the future. Think it'll work? Hey, come back here! All we need in this picture is a hitchhiker. Some fun. Wow, watch that pickup. You. And a sea biscuit by a nose.
picture is coming to no good end. It's like 10 more minutes to go. While he's getting that ready, I should note that the Day in the Country was shot uh, in 1941 in New Jersey. There we go. That was it. you're about to see and there's a bit in here of animation that's the oldest known animation as well
explain what it is in a bit.
question, Miss Teggy. The only way possible, known to science, for audiences to successfully view true three dimension is through the use of glasses. Are these the same as Polaroid sunglasses? Not exactly, but made of the same material. Tell me, Doctor, how does natural vision affect the eyes? When natural vision standards of photography and projection are adhered to, your eyes will function as they do in nature, which is healthy and beneficial. You should leave the theater with your eyes relaxed and refreshed as never before in viewing a motion picture. That uh, last bit there was from M.L. Gunsberg Presents the Third Dimension that got run just before Buona Devil to introduce audiences to what 3D was all about. Uh, Shirley Teggy, who you saw there, hadn't done anything in 50 years in front of a camera, and we got her to come to the first expo, which was kind of cool. And the guy playing the optometrist was Milton Gunsberg's brother, who actually was an optometrist. But he had kind of an interest in selling the process, I think, you know? Uh, also, I did wind up calling Fred back and apologizing to him because that footage from Day in the Country was shot in the early 40s. It was a short subject called Stereo Laughs, and it never got released. And then in 1953, when Robert Lippert needed some short subjects between when Buona Devil and House of Wax opened, theaters were desperate for product, he sold the short to Lippert. They retitled it, Day in the Country, hired Joe Besser to narrate it, and that's why we have a Picture 1941 and Sound 1953. And the last note I wanted to make was on the Norling footage uh, from New York City. Uh, we're pretty sure that those indoor shots were shot at Lox Norling Studios, which was the building where Duart Labs is today. Uh, by the way, does anybody know what that bridge was that they go over? I don't, because I'm not from New York. I was thinking maybe it was the George Washington Bridge or something. It might be kind of funny. Any questions? No? There's one, OK. Okay, so what challenges do you face with trying to restore this material? Well, of course, some of it was nitrates, so right off the bat you have issues with flammable film and shipping it and all that stuff, but uh, the two anaglyph pieces, Day in the Country and uh, the Crespinel footage, I'm sorry, and also Plasticon, those were all anaglyphic prints, and so you have to extract those, the left eye and right eye from it. Dan perfected this process. I asked him about you know, whether he should patent the process, and he pointed out to me that there's no reason to because there's maybe like a half a dozen things you could use it for. Uh, maybe if we ever find the last Lippert short, it might turn up that way. But other than some girly movies that were produced in the 50s, really nothing else survives in just anaglyphs, so it's not really a problem. Um, someday, maybe we could find the left eye, right eye pairs on these things, but it's very unlikely. Probably it was all destroyed. Uh, there's probably another half a dozen to a dozen shorts that were made in the 20s and uh, 30s, uh, in the teens, rather. And uh, maybe they'll some someday show up. Uh, uh, somebody found about four minutes of one short that ran in 1922 also, but only one eye, unfortunately. By the way, there was a, a feat. The first 3D publicly shown was a feature film. It was called The Power of Love in 1922. And it was shown at the Ambassador Hotel one time uh, for an invited audience. And then it kind of vanished, although about two weeks ago, I actually found some documentation that it ran in Newark, New Jersey as a test screening also in 1922. But that's about all I know so far. But again, that's a lost film. The earliest surviving is Plasticon, which you saw there. Hi, I just had a question about the Washington scenes. Um, it looked like the, the farthest objects were actually with, without any parallax, making the whole scene out of screen. And I'm just wondering, was that the way it was intended to be shot. I think they didn't even know really about uh, you know moving the the lenses. You know the, I forgot what the word is for it. I'm sorry, but you know moving the lenses in and out and parallax and that kind of stuff. They were just shooting two cameras, I think, and okay. it just happens. Some of it looks good and some of it doesn't look good. Uh, some of it Dan was able to adjust when he did his 2020 process, but not all of it. Okay, so there was no alignment adjustments you made to Dan did some it. Dan did some alignment issues on that one. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Jeff, first I just wanted to thank you for doing this restoration. It's, it's really great to have, have that stuff available. I thank think it's you. pretty cool to have too. Yeah, thanks. 
And, and my technical question is, uh, the day of the country, the motion looked very smooth. You know, I was looking for some uh, motion judder or something. What frame rate was that? Oh, well, that was a day. Day in the country was shot in sound era, so that's nineteen. It was shot in nineteen forty one, so that's twenty four frames per second. Mm -hmm. I mean, the original. We found the original script for it for Stereo Laughs, and it's just a different narration. And so they hired Joe Besser, as I say, in the fifties and just re-narrated it. But it was shot in nineteen forty one. The silent stuff was shot in the you know the mid twenties. Uh, we're not really sure what the exact frame rate was. We pr we transferred it at about. I think, I think we transferred to 24 frames, but I'm not positive that's what it was shot at. Thank you. Anybody else? I think that's it. That's it? Okay, thanks everybody.